Welcome to the Word Saves Ministry. I am Reverend Ron Ponell. Before we get started in the book of Acts, let's all unite our hearts in prayer. Well, Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity that we can use this program to honor you, to worship you, and to glorify your holy name. Dear Lord, we ask for your blessings. We ask you to bless this production. Bless any and all people who are viewing at this time. We ask that the Holy Spirit guide us, Father God, and that it reach and touch the hearts of those who hear your word. We lift you up high, dear Lord, as our Lord and Lord and King of Kings. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. The author of the book of Acts, Luke, emphasizes the living church. He is the one who documents the growth of the church and through his writing directs the spread of the gospel across the Roman Empire. He began his book, which we call the Acts of the Apostles, or simply Acts, by continuing his story from his writings in the Gospel of Luke, where he describes Jesus' work in Galilee, Judea, and especially Jerusalem. It ended, as the other three Gospels did, with Jesus' death and resurrection. This book also unites the Gospels and the epistles. Now Luke, known as a physician, had encounters with the Apostle Paul for both their message was in behalf of the Gentile. Now, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter one. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Acts, like Luke, is addressed to Theophilus, literally meaning lover of God. Or this could be the name of a particular individual, or it could simply be the general term for any of God's people. The fact both Luke and Acts were so addressed indicated both were written by the same author. Jesus gave his commandment to the apostles he had chosen. Now, the commandment here most likely refers to the Great Commission, which is the commandment recorded that Jesus gave before he ascended. It is an appropriate beginning for the book of Acts since the book records the apostles' response to the Great Commission in obedience to Jesus' command. Apostle means sent forth on a mission. The mission and who did the sending depends on the context. But in the New Testament and in the book of Acts in particular, it is most generally referred to the men chosen by Jesus and set forth to preach the gospel and especially to bear testimony to the resurrection. The apostles met together in Jerusalem. Christ having ordered them not to depart, therefore, but to wait for the outpour of the Holy Spirit. This would be the baptism by the Holy Ghost, giving them power to work miracles, enlightening and sanctifying their souls. It confirms the divine promise and encourages us to depend on it, that we have heard it from Christ. For in him, all the promises of God are absolute. Jesus gave many convincing verifications that he was alive. He appeared to the disciples over a period of 40 days. This occurred within seven weeks between the Passover when Jesus was crucified and the Pentecost. The number 40 is significant as it also recalls the 40 days in which Moses received instruction on Mount Sinai. But here, it is Jesus who gives instruction, this time from the Mount of Olives. During his appearance to the disciples, he clarified the meaning of the kingdom in the light of his ministry of salvation. The kingdom's message now takes on an additional 
memorandum and a different emphasis. The witnesses preach Jesus as the resurrected living Savior, the representative of God's kingdom doing God's work through his new church to come. Now, let's read on. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Which you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The first task of the disciples is to wait for the gift my father promised. The blessing intended for them shall come for the baptizing with the Holy Spirit was well worth waiting for. The apostles are not to leave Jerusalem. They are not to preach anything nor undertake any missionary program for the moment. They are to wait for the Holy Spirit to begin the work. This underscores the importance of the baptizing of fire before the gospel mission. Luke emphasized the spirit is essential for the expansion of the good news. The father's promise was that they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit. In contrast of John's water baptism, notice that the Holy Spirit baptism was a promise, not a command. And it was not a water baptism. Further, this promise was addressed to the apostles, not to mankind in general, nor even to every Christian. But the day will come when the Holy Spirit will reside in the hearts of those who seek Jesus. Now, the apostles still thought that Jesus soon is going to restore the kingdom of Israel. They seem to be viewing the kingdom of God as a restored nation of Israel. This knowledge is not allowed to them. It is nor for you to know, and therefore it is not for you to ask. This idea of Israel as the people of God was deeply embedded in the Hebrew scripture. They spoke, for example, of a people God had chosen out of all the people on the face of the earth to be his treasured possession. After all, the prophets of the old had promised that in the last days, the fortune of Israel would be restored and God would pour out his spirit on all people as mentioned in the book of Joel. Now let's turn to Joel 2.28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. Once again, the disciples are relating an earthly restoration opposed to the kingdom of God, which Jesus was referring to. They were impatient. But God's time is the best time. But on the other hand, Jesus was not denying that someday there would be a restoration of Israel. In fact, the entire world is to be renewed. But God's purpose for Israel and the world in a political sense is not our concern. The apostles and evangelists were simply to proclaim the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. Whether the news was accepted or not, is not their concern. The church should not speculate about prophecies. We should simply preach the power of the risen Christ and bring salvation to the world. Now, continuing. Now, when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight.
And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. After giving his mandate to the apostles to be his witnesses, Jesus ascended from the earth and disappeared into a cloud. The sight of Jesus being shrouded in the cloud is significant of the divine God. This was the symbol of of the glorious divine presence amongst God's people in the Old Testament, particularly in the tabernacle. The apostles were heartfelt in asking about which Jesus had directed or encouraged them to seek. Our Lord knew that his ascension and the teaching of the Holy Spirit would soon end these expectations and therefore only gave them a rebuke but it is caution to his church in all ages to take heed of a desire of forbidden knowledge. He had given his disciples instructions for the discharge of their duty, both for his death and since his resurrection. And this knowledge is enough for a Christian that under the influence of the Holy Spirit, they may in one way or another be witnesses for Christ on earth while in heaven, he manages their concerns with perfect wisdom, truth, and love. While Jesus was lifted up, the disciples observed this as fact. We must remember that God and Christ are not up there somewhere. God is everywhere, hence omnipresence. While Christ was ascending in a cloud, revealed to the disciples that he was being exalted in the presence of God. They must have been astonished as well as saddened at the sight of Jesus rising as they watched intently, their Lord being taken up and taken away from them. Suddenly, two angels appear and deliver them a message from God. Jesus had concerns for the initiation of his church on earth. Therefore, he sent back two angels who appeared as two men in white apparel to remind the apostles the church is is assigned with responsibility that can be fulfilled only by looking forward, not backward and not upward. We are told what the angel said to him. Check their curiosity. You men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into the heaven? He calls them men of Galilee to remind them that they were all chiseled from the same rock. Christ had put great honor upon them in making them his ambassadors. But they must be reminded that they are men of Galilee. The angels asked, why stand there like Galileans, rude and unpolished men gazing up into the heaven? What would you see? You have seen all that you were called to see together. Why do you look any further? Why do you stand gazing at men, frightened, perplexed, and astonished? Christ's disciples should never gaze because they have a sure decree to go by, a sure foundation to build upon, to confirm their faith concerning Christ's second coming. Their master had often told them of this, and the angels are sent at this opportune time to remind the apostles to focus on the task to come. May our expectations of it be steadfast and joyful, giving diligence to be found of him blameless. Now, let's read on. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. 
These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. After this extraordinary experience of watching Jesus' ascension, the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Luke described the distance between the two places as a Sabbath day walk from the city, less than a mile. According to Jewish tradition, this was the extent to which a pious Jew was allowed to travel on the Sabbath. Luke's use of strictly Jewish tradition shows his intimate knowledge of the local customs. It suggests that Luke received his information about Jesus' ascension from Jerusalem area sources. His information could have even come from one of the apostles or someone who wrote down what the apostles had said about the ascension. The 11 apostles are listed. Note that there are only 11 because... As you will see, Judas had killed himself and had not yet been replaced. In view of the important work to be done by the apostles, it would be appropriate that Luke name them here. They are the apostles of the 11, showing that they had a special call as apostles, separating them from the disciples. Now, this is where we differentiate the apostles from the disciples. The apostles were chosen by Jesus. The disciples are defined as Jesus' followers. The 120 included both apostles and disciples. Now, with the apostles were some women, including Jesus' mother and also his brothers. This surely appears to be a clear reference of his physical brothers, but the term brothers have been debated by Bible scholars that it could have also meant spiritual brothers. In Jerusalem, they continued to pray together. And when they went up to an upper room and there they abode, they assembled every day and spent time together in religious observance in expectation of the descent of the Holy Spirit. Now, on the basis of incomplete information, Bible scholars have surmised different theories about the upper room. Now, some think it was one of the upper rooms in the temple, but it cannot be thought that the chief priests would allow Christ's disciples to constantly reside in any of those rooms. It was said indeed by the same historian that they were continually in the temple, but it was in the courts of the temple at the hours of prayer where they could not be hindered from attending. But it should seem the upper room was a private house, perhaps of one of Jesus's followers. Mentioned in the text is the woman and mother of Jesus, Mary. Though not specifically identified by name, the woman is believed to be Mary of Magdalene. They continued in prayer and petition. Praise for the promise and pray for further mercy. So in seeking God, they did this in one accord. These intimate followers of Jesus were together in holy love. And there was no quarrel, no discord among them. And those who so kept the unity of the Spirit in the Lord of peace are best prepared to receive the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Now, let's read on. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. Men and brethren. This scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Judas Iscariot, whose role as a disciple has been also debated for centuries. Jesus, who is man and God, knew what Judas had to do to fulfill prophecy. However, he turns out to be the evil antagonist to our beloved Savior. What do we really know 
about Judas Iscariot. Now let's look into his history because Judas Iscariot was the most fascinating of all the disciples. Now, he was also the 12th disciple chosen by Nathaniel. He was born in Corinth, a small town in southern Judea. He was a young boy when his parents moved to Jericho, where he had lived and was employed with his father's various business enterprises until he became interested in the preaching and the work of John the Baptist. Judas's parents were Sadducees, and when their son joined John's disciples, they disowned him. When Nathanael met Judas at Terachia, he was seeking employment with a fish drying enterprise at the lower end of the Sea of Galilee. He was 30 years old and unmarried when he joined the apostles. Judas was probably the best educated man among the 12 and the only Judean in Jesus's inner circle. He had no outstanding trait of personal strength, though he had many outwardly appearing traits of culture and habit of training. He was a good thinker, but not always a truly honest thinker. Judas did not really understand himself. He was not really sincere in dealing with himself. Now, Andrew appointed Judas as the treasurer of 12, a position that he was exceedingly fitted to hold. He maintained his responsibilities of the office honestly, faithfully, and most effectively up until the time of the betrayal. The apostles loved him. He was really one of them. He must have believed in Jesus but we doubt whether he really loved him wholeheartedly as per se John the Divine. In the case of Judas illustrates the truthfulness of the saying, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end therefore is death. It is altogether possible to fall victim to the peaceful deception of pleasant adjustments of the path of sin and death. Be assured that Judas was always financially loyal to his master and his fellow apostles. Money could have never been the motive for his betrayal. To Jesus, Judas was a faith adventurer. From the beginning, the master fully understood the weaknesses of his apostles and well knew the dangers of admitting him to the fellowship. But... It is the nature of the Son of God to give every creative being a full and equal chance for salvation and survival. When the disreputable and sinful business was all over, this traitor, who thought lightly of selling his friend for 30 pieces of silver to satisfy his long-nursed craving for revenge, rushed out committed the final act in the drama of fleeing from the realities of moral existence. Suicide. Continuing. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called, in their own language, a keldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in it, and let another take his office. But the chief priest took the silver pieces. It is not lawful to put them into the treasury, because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. It is possible, but unknown, that Judas might have purchased a field or a piece of ground with the reward of his iniquity. Or it might have been an unfinished transaction. The priests knowing his intentions might have completed the purchase and as Judas was dead now, applied the field thus bought 
for the burial of strangers, Jews from foreign parts or others who are visiting Jerusalem and had died there. Though this case is possible, yet the passages will bear a very consistent interpretation without the assistance of this conjecture, for we often attribute a man's consequence of his own actions. Through such consequence was never designated nor wished for himself. Thus we say of a man embarking in hazardous enterprises, he is gone to seek his death. One whose conduct has been disastrous and disgracing himself and his reputation. All these, though undesignated, were consequences of certain acts, as the buying of the field was consequences of Judas's treason. David had not only foretold his sin, but also foretold his punishment in Psalms 69, 25. Let his habitation be desolate. The Psalms refers to the Messiah. Predictions of the destruction of David's enemies must be applied to the enemies of Christ and particularly to Judas. He probably hanged himself on a tree projecting over the precipitous of the valley of Hinnom and afterward on the account of the rope or the limb breaking fell headlong with such force to burst his body open on jagged rocks. Additionally, it was prophesied, let another take his office, Acts 120 and Psalms 109.8. Therefore of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. In Psalms, David was saying that his enemy is unworthy of his office and it should be given to another. However, the application of David's words by Peter was that Judas was unworthy of his office, and that it should be given to another, just as David said centuries before. Now, let's read on. And they proposed two, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justus, and Matthias. And they prayed, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. The eleven disciples that remained had been very close to Jesus for three years. He had taught them when they were away from the crowds. He had helped them in his ministry on earth. Also, they had seen him many times after the resurrection, and they watched him ascend to heaven. They wanted the new disciple to be someone who had known Jesus as they did. With them, he must tell everyone that Jesus was victorious over death. So he needed to have seen with his own eyes that Jesus was alive. Peter establishes the essential criteria for the person who will replace Judas as an apostle. He must have been an active disciple from the beginning of Jesus' ministry from baptism to the end, his ascension. It is not clear who proposed the two candidates, the 11 apostles, or was it the assembly of the 120 disciples? Whichever they agree that there were two good candidates for consideration. First one was Joseph, also known as Barsabbath, which means the son of the Sabbath, also known as Justice. The second was Matthias. Now, the choice of Judas's replacement will be decided by casting lots. Now, casting lots was a common practice throughout the ancient world, including Israel. Casting lots was a process or prediction by which participants sought God's guidance with regards to important decisions or problems. Participants would throw pebbles or 
small objects and interpret the results to learn God's will. While the process might look something like modern day practice of throwing dice, it was quite different in that it looked to God rather than chance for help. In this case, the lot falls on Matthias. Now this means that God has chosen Matthias to fulfill the position of the apostle that was vacated by Judas. The first Christians couldn't tolerate the number 11 for long. There was an obvious parallel between the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. The number 12 had to be restored. The addition of Matthias to the apostleship accomplished that. Now, we don't know anything else about Matthias or Joseph, who they called Justice, for that is all that was mentioned about them in the Bible. After this extraordinary experience of watching Jesus' ascension, the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Luke described the distance between the two places as a Sabbath day walk from the city, which was less than a mile, according to Jewish tradition. Luke's use of strictly Jewish expression shows his intimate knowledge of the local customs. Now let's continue in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Pentecost, also called the Feast of Weeks, was a Jewish feast that occurred 50 days after the Passover, or to be more precise, 50 days after the Sabbath following the Passover. In this case, Pentecost would have occurred 50 days after Jesus' death. And because of the way the day was determined, it always fell on the first day of the week. They were to count seven Sabbaths after the Passover. Then the next day was the feast, as mentioned in the book of Leviticus. Now this means that the event of this day, which was one of the most important days of all in the New Testament occurred on the first day of the week, the same day of the week that Jesus arose from the dead. Pentecost was one of the three annual holy days for which all Jewish males over 20 years of age were required by law to assemble in Jerusalem. This is why we find Jews from all over the world present on this day. All of the apostles were assembled in one place on this day. And this happened in Jerusalem, the very place that Jesus had told them to wait for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was when they were all with one accord in one place. What place it was, we are not told particularly, whether in the temple where they attended at public times, or whether it was their own upper room where they met at other times. But it was at Jerusalem because this had been the place which God chose to put his name there. And the prophecy was that the word of the Lord should go forth to all nations. It was now the place of general rendezvous of all devout people. Here, God had promised to meet them and bless them. Here, therefore, we meet them and with this blessing of blessings, suddenly, God gives signs of sound and sight. Their divine origin and supernatural character is clear. The sound is from heaven and is like blowing of a violent wind. The tongues that appear and seem to be 
flames of fire, a violent rushing wind symbolizes the Holy Spirit. The sound fills the whole house. It attracts crowds upon its occurrence or possibly as the believers move out into the street and towards the temple. What has arrived is the all-encompassing divine presence. The divided tongues like flames of fire resting on each also symbolize the spirit of God, especially his power. The sign given was fire that John the Baptist said concerning Christ might be fulfilled that he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. They were now in the feast of Pentecost, celebrating the memorial of the giving of the law upon Mount Sinai that was given in fire, thus called the fiery law. This fire appeared in cloven tongues, cloven meaning split or metaphorically speaking, the ability to speak different tongues or languages. The actions of the spirit were many, that of speaking with various tongues was one and was singled out to be the first indication of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the crowd's initial reaction shows us that God's powerful saving presence will always astonish us and challenge our current understanding of him and his ways. From the Spirit we have the Word of God and by him Christ would speak to the world and he gave the spirit to the disciples, not only to endow them with knowledge, but also to endow them with a power to publish and proclaim to the world the good news. Pentecostal denomination regularly practices the speaking and praying in tongues. It is a prerequisite to be baptized in the Holy Spirit as it was for the apostles if you are to qualify for a ministerial credential. However, a spirit-filled believer receives the same benefit to those who humble themselves to the Lord. The Apostle Paul came across some disciples in Ephesus and asked, Have you received the Holy Spirit? They replied, We have not heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Paul said to them, Unto what were you baptized? So they said, Unto John's baptism. After the Apostle Paul explained the difference between the two baptisms, the disciples in Ephesus received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with you always, giving you guidance through the gift of discernment, fills your heart with peace, love, and the goodness of Christ, hears your prayers, and is there to protect you. The Holy Spirit allows you to experience God's love it provides the overflowing fulfillment of joy, truly knowing in your hearts all that is promised to the devout, spirit-filled believer will come to pass in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.